All right, guys, hello and welcome. Um, here we got another installment of our physics video lecture series. Um, today we are going to be talking about atomic theory and the photoelectric effect, uh, which if it hasn't been used already, I think might make a pretty good band name. All right, let's jump in. Okay, so atomic theory. Um, atomic theory is the history of how we came to understand what an atom is. Uh, for as long as we can remember, one of the biggest questions that's ever been asked is, you know, what is stuff, what is stuff made out of, right? And atomic theory is trying to answer that question. So uh, we're gonna go way, way back. The first person that we're gonna talk about uh, who talked about this was named Democritus. He was a Greek philosopher um, and he was one of the first people who came out and said that all matter, uh, all stuff, is made of these little tiny, tiny particles that can't be broken down, right? He was looking around and he said, if you take something, you can keep breaking it in half and breaking it in half and breaking it into smaller pieces, but eventually you're gonna be left with something that can't be broken. And he is the one credited with inventing the word atom, or for the Greek word, a Tomas, which literally translates in Greek to be indivisible, meaning you can't cut it in half anymore. Um, interesting to note is that one of his big uh, rivals at the time was this guy named Aristotle. Aristotle was much more famous, and Aristotle's theory was that stuff was made of the four elements, uh, air, fire, uh, wind, and water. Excuse me, earth, fire, wind, and water. And he said all things were composed of that. Like, for example, a rock was made up of solely earth and water was made up of solely water. But we as humans were made of all four of them. Um, you know, our bones are hard, they're made of rock. Our blood is liquid, it's made of water. We are hot, we have a fire inside of us. And we breathe, so there's air in us. Um, at the time, um, Aristotle was much more popular and a much better arguer. So people ended up believing him instead of Democritus, which goes to show why we use science. This is why we use the scientific method. The best argument is not always the correct fact, okay? So this is a good story to remember right here. All right, we're gonna jump forward a couple thousand years um, to this guy right here, J.J. Thompson. J.J. Thompson is the guy who discovered the electron, okay? Uh, before him, we thought these little tiny atomos, these atoms, couldn't be broken down, right? But what he realized was that there were positive and negative charges, okay? Um, and he kind of thought of it as we would think of a chocolate chip cookie, right? So if you can look at the picture of J.J. Thompson's atom here, um, the white part, the surrounding bit, you can think of that as the cookie, uh, and he thought that the cookie was all positively charged. Okay, um, inside of that cookie, there were these little chocolate chips, and he thought that, that those were the electrons were, right? He thought that inside of the cookie were all these little chocolate chips, okay? So you have the positive cookie, and you have the negatively charged little electrons, just kind of spread about, okay? Um, when you see this model, it'll often be referred to as the plum pudding model. Plum pudding is a British dessert. Um, I've never had plum pudding, I doubt you have, so that's why I call them the chocolate chip cookie model, but you will see it as the plum pudding theory or the plum pudding model, okay? Moving forward, one of J.J. Thompson's students was named Ernest Rutherford, and Ernest Rutherford is the guy that discovered the nucleus, okay? So the way that he did this was, um, at the time he was experimenting and he was shooting these little tiny things called alpha particles which are positive charges at a little thin sheet of gold okay what he thought was going to happen is that the little positive charges would just go straight through the gold um, think about it like a like a bullet just going through a piece of paper right that's not exactly what happened what ended up happening is that some of the positive particles went through the gold but some of them bounced back. And what he realized was that if some of them bounced back, okay, 
that we know when two positive things come near each other, they push each other away. So if he was shooting positive particles, okay, at this gold, and the positive particles were bouncing back, that means they had to be hitting a positive particle, right? So what he realized was, is that not only were there electrons, but there had to be this positive chunk in the middle of the atom, okay? Um, he also realized the nucleus had to be really small because most of the positive particles were going through the atoms. Only a small amount were bouncing back. Um, just to give you a look at his setup, uh, here is where he was getting the positive particles. They're called alpha particles. Those alpha particles were going through the gold. Most of them went through the gold, but some of them bounced, and some of them bounced straight back. Okay. So what Rutherford realized is something that I still find to be one of the most amazing facts uh, that I learned when studying physics, okay? When I say that a nucleus of an atom is small, what I mean is that the nucleus of the atom, okay, only makes up 0.0000000001% of the volume of an atom, meaning like, you know, if an atom is this big, okay, the nucleus is like a tiny little piece of dust in the middle, okay? 99 point, all of these nines percent of an atom is empty space, and it's in that empty space where electrons float around, right? If you were to take every atom in every human being and remove this empty space, every single atom, or every single human being on the planet could fit inside of a sugar cube. Okay, that's how much empty space is in the atoms that make up the world around us, which again, I just find fascinating. Okay, moving forward. Up next, we have Niels Bohr. Okay? Um, Niels Bohr is bringing in modern physics, now, or close to modern physics. What he came up with is he realized that the electrons weren't just around the nucleus, okay, that they actually orbited the nucleus in a very specific uh, path, what he called an orbit, okay? He compared this to uh, the planets orbiting around the sun, okay, which is why sometimes this is called the planetary model. Uh, this is the model that you are probably the most familiar with. This is the one that you draw in chemistry class most of the time. Um, and honestly, it was a huge step forward, right? Uh, he also realized that these electrons could jump from one energy level to the next energy level. Um, interestingly enough, he also realized that they never existed in between the levels, okay? So you can kind of, he thought electrons teleported, right? So if you were in this level right here and you wanted to move up to the next level, you just teleported and jumped boop, from one to the next. You never existed in between which is kind of crazy, right? This is a great, great model. Um, it uh, gives us this idea that certain electrons have certain amounts of energy, okay? Um, so if we look at an atom, here's your big nucleus, right? You have your electrons floating around. And these are called your energy states, right? Or the orbital paths. The ones that is closest to the nucleus is called the ground state. It has the least amount of energy. The ones that go farther away from the nucleus have more energy. They're called excited states. Okay. And we're going to see these again when we talk about emission and absorption. But the thing is, is that Niels, Mr. Bohr, he was really close, but he wasn't 100% spot on. So this enters the world of what we call quantum physics. Okay, You may have heard of this word before. Um, what quantum theory in its heart says is that electrons uh, don't just sit in a fixed path, okay? Electrons act like waves. And because they act like waves, they don't just sit in this orbit, okay? They're not, they're not circling around a nucleus in this pretty little pattern. Instead, they exist in these kind of clouds, okay? So every electron has this area that it may may not, it'll, it'll be somewhere in that area, but you're never 100% sure, uh, certain where it's gonna be, okay? But using probability, okay, using these idea of um, 
very advanced algorithms and probability, we can tell with pretty decent accuracy where an electron is going to be. Um, one of the big things about this theory, though, is, is that we can never know where an electron is and how fast it's going. Because as soon as we start to measure how fast it's going, we disrupt its position and it moves. This is called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. This is some pretty upper level stuff. Um, but this is the world of quantum mechanics that we've come to now. Really the way you can think about it is, is the more that we learn about the atom, the more complicated we realize it is. Bohr's model was beautiful because it was simple, right? You have a nucleus and you just have these electrons that just float around the nucleus. It's not really like that. Those electrons can be anywhere inside of these little clouds and it's very difficult for us to tell exactly where they are and how fast they're going. We can usually know one or the other. And in order to do so, we're not using basic math, we're using probability, okay? So here is a list of the big four, okay? J.J. Thompson, plum pudding model, right? Um, there's a big positively charged cookie with a bunch of negatively charged chocolate chips in it. Rutherford just, uh, gave us the nucleus, right? There's a big old positive nucleus in the middle with those negative charges floating around it. Bohr said that the positive charges, uh, sorry, that the negative charges uh, surrounding the nucleus existed in fixed uh, orbits like planets and our quantum model tells us that those orbits are actually more like big clouds of probability where the electron could be at any point in time. Okay? Here's another picture just real fast about the quantum theory. You can kind of see what the orbitals look like. They're not circles, they're like little clouded areas. Okay. All right, so here again are your four. There's a run through of each one. Um, I forgot to mention that down here, I linked, this is really small, the link is in the PowerPoint though. Uh, there's a link to a really good YouTube video. It's a TED Ed video about atomic theory. Or if you just go on YouTube and type in TED Ed atomic theory, it's a great video. I usually show it in class, so you should watch that. Okay? All right. So the next thing we're going to talk about is light itself and uh, some pretty cool stuff that we can do with it. Um, light is said to have a dual nature. Okay? If something has a dual nature, uh, usually what that means is it's living a double life. It has two identities, like a transformer. Right? Bumblebee is both a robot and a car. Um, Bruce Banner is both himself and the Hulk. Okay? Light has a dual nature. What this means is that light is both a particle and a wave. So you're going to hear us talk about this a bunch. Um, we saw before using that double slit experiment, right? When the light went through those little tiny openings, right? It spread, it diffracted, and when light hits itself, it made all of those different lines, okay? That's how we found out that light was a wave. Today we're going to see how we realize that light is also a particle, okay? All right. Um, if, again, if you want to watch a YouTube video about this, I've included that right here. This explains it in great detail, but I'm going to try to do the best that I can right now. All right. So in order to understand this, we are going to talk about the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect uh, was the brainchild of a certain man uh, with crazy hair who likes to stick his tongue out. You may have heard of this is, if you don't know, this is Albert Einstein. And the first Nobel Prize that Einstein won was not for his theory of relativity, it was for the photoelectric effect. Okay, so what did Einstein realize? All right, so in his experiments, what Einstein figured out was if you took light, okay, regular light, and if you shined that light onto a piece of metal, okay, electrons phew, would jump off. Okay? It's kind of weird, doesn't sound that crazy, but I want you to think about this, okay? Before the photoelectric experiment, everybody thought light was a wave. We'd seen it act like a wave, right? Young's double slit experiment. We know light's a wave. We know it bends, we know it reflects, we know it refracts and defracts. It does all of those things. It polarizes everything. Light's a wave. This tells us 
that when we take that light, which if you never notice, light has no weight, right? Light doesn't have any matter. It doesn't have any mass to it, okay? But if you take that light and shine it onto metal, it knocks off electrons. Electrons do have mass. They are made of something, okay? This is like a ghost coming down and punching the electrons off of the metal. This is kind of nuts, okay? Okay, so what we realized is that electrons, which are made of matter, came out on the other side, okay? Not waves, it wasn't waves that came out, it was actual electrons that came out, all right? So, we started thinking, and Einstein was like, well, we know that light is a wave, right? Light can diffract, right? It bends when it goes through openings, it can refract, or sorry, it can reflect, it can, uh, Defract, it can reflect, it can refract like we saw in the jello, okay? But light itself, okay, was doing something new. So what this told us is that light is made of particles, all right? It had to be, okay? But these particles are special. They're called photons. Maybe you've heard this word before. Um, it is the, I think it's Latin or Greek word for light. Anything that involves light has the word, uh, the, uh, the prefix photo to it, right? photograph or photography, right? Okay. What is a photon? A photon is a packet of light, all right, that has a specific amount of energy, okay? Photons travel at the speed of light, duh, they're made of light, okay? They have zero mass, okay, so they're not made of anything, okay? But they have a specific or what we call discrete amount of energy meaning that we can measure a photon, okay? Uh, a photon is equal to the amount of energy that it contains. And it's important to note here that all light is made of photons, okay? So uh, visible light is made of photons, but so is ultraviolet light or infrared light or radio waves or microwaves, x-rays, gamma rays, all of them are made of photons because they're all electromagnetic waves, right? So, the photoelectric effect. So again, one photon of light can knock off one electron from the surface of a metal, okay? There's an easy kind of a way to think about this. When you shine light on a metal, and it has to be a certain type of light and a certain type of metal, we'll get to that, all right? When you shine light onto the metal, electrons pop off. So a couple things that are important to learn here, all right? One photon interacts with one electron, okay? We call the thing that comes off a photoelectron, all right? So it's got a special name because of its origins, where it comes from. First thing to remember, what happens when we use brighter light, okay? When we use brighter light, brighter light has more energy, meaning it has more photons, okay? So when we use brighter light, okay, that contains more photons, that means we're gonna release more electrons, okay? The more photons that hit, the more electrons that are released. How do we make more photons? Well, that is gonna look like brighter light. So the brighter the light, the more number of photons, uh, or sorry, of electrons are released, okay? Again, here is a YouTube video to explain the photoelectric effect. It's linked right there. And lastly, what, uh, let's talk about the energy of these electrons that are released, okay? So, looking at this, this is uh, a wave spectrum, okay? Which side of this spectrum has the most energy? Hopefully you were thinking, this side does, right? Why does this side have a higher energy? Well, that's because it has a higher frequency, right? There's more waves every second on this side. There's less waves every second on this side. This side has longer wavelengths. The waves themselves are longer, which means their frequencies are smaller. And on this side, our waves are shorter. Our wavelength is shorter, which means our frequency is higher. Okay, so how does this play in to the photoelectric effect? Okay, the energy of these electrons that are released, okay? So the energy of light depends on its frequency, right? We saw that. Radio waves 
And microwaves have really low frequencies. They have really big wavelengths, right? Uh, X-rays, gamma rays have really high frequencies because they have really short wavelengths. X-rays and gamma rays contain more energy. That's why they're more harmful to us, where radio waves and microwaves have less energy. They're less harmful, okay? So the energy of a photon, okay, is based on its frequency, okay? So the energy of a photoelectron, the ones that are released when we shine light on the metal, also depend on the frequency. And we can take this one step further, okay? There's actually a threshold, okay, um, of what light releases photons, and, or uh, re releases photoelectrons, and what light does not release photoelectrons. And we call this the threshold frequency. So if you look right here, okay, we have red light, green light, blue light, okay, Roy G. Biv, right, red, orange, green, right, blue. Red light has long wavelengths, it has low energy, right? Blue light has high energy because it has a high frequency, it has a shorter wavelength, okay? When you shine red light onto a surface, okay, you get no electrons, okay? Red light does not have enough energy to release those electrons. Green light is where the threshold starts, okay? If you have green light or higher, Okay, right, so if you're thinking here, this would be uh, what? Roy G. Biv. So here is your cutoff, right about there. Red light, orange light, yellow light does not release electrons. But green light, blue light, indigo, violet, those all release electrons. Okay, and the same goes for ultraviolet, x rays, gamma rays. All of this light will release these electrons. Okay. And we can see the difference here, is as we go up that scale, so green light will release the electrons, right? But they're going pretty slow. Blue light not only releases electrons, but now they're moving even faster. So what we gotta see is that as you increase the light's frequency, you increase the kinetic energy of the released electrons, the photoelectrons, okay? Remember, kinetic energy just means speed. So if we look at this, again, here we have some red light. These are little photons of red light. And when we shine them onto the metal, nothing happens, okay? But when we up the frequency of the light to blue light, well now, aha, the electrons are hitting, and or the photons hit the metal and release the electrons. When we increase the number of photons that are there, okay, right? So we still have blue light. It's the same frequency, but now we have more photons, which means we're releasing more electrons, all right? So the thing to remember here, all right, in the photoelectric effect, all right, you are shining light onto metal, okay? That releases electrons. There's a threshold, okay? Only certain frequencies of light can release the electrons, all right? When you increase the frequency of the light, meaning you change its color, okay, going from green uh, to blue or blue to indigo or indigo to violet, the bigger the frequency, the faster the electrons move. When you increase the brightness of the light, okay, or the intensity, you are now increasing the number of photons, and each photon releases one electron. All right? I know this is a lot. That's why I put it all in the PowerPoint, so read through it, watch this video again, take some notes, and as always, I will be on uh, Zoom to answer any questions that you guys have. All right, hope you guys have a great day.